The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on uh, your time zone. Uh, we'd like to give uh, everybody just a few more seconds to log in. We see some folks uh, still trying to log in, so we will be back in just a few short moments. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the second in our webinar series to help prepare you for the fall book, highlighting data from ratings prospect study number 12. My name is PJ Kling. I'm the head of product and business development, along with Lee Jacobs, who is our head of research here at New Voodoo. We've got a few things to go over today. And as always, there is no sales pitch, just information that we hope will help you to be successful in the coming months. If you have any questions about what you see today, there's a place in your GoToWebinar control panel to submit them, and we will do our best to get to as many as possible at the end. In today's webinar, which should take about 30 minutes, we've got an updated look at whether or not radio still leads the way for new music discovery, an update on where streaming services fall into the plethora of competition that you're facing, how to best frame your promotions this fall along with the best times to run them, and then we'll take a look at local versus national contesting. Uh, we'll talk through how the audience perceives both, and we'll also look at how to win, no matter which side of the, the uh, battle that you're on. Finally, we'll take a look at how we turn Lee's data into actionable marketing strategies for your station and some of the newest digital products that are out there. But as we do with everything at New Voodoo, we always take a look at the data first. So with that, I turn it over to Lee. Thanks very much, PJ. Uh, the data that we'll be looking at today primarily come from our most, re uh, most recent ratings prospect study, number 12, with 3,049 persons, 14 to 54, from across all PPM markets, proportional to market population. Uh, so more from uh, New York than there are from, say, Hartford, uh, Connecticut. Uh, weighted a total population for gender, age, and ethnicity, conducted use and compensated online sample, as we do all of our research here at New Voodoo, and in the field back uh, just a couple of months ago, toward the beginning of June of this year. So we wanted to start with a quick refresher here because we love ratings like these. They're important people. They, uh, you know, they determine our uh, our fates. Uh, so if we're talking about contesting, which is the subject of today's webinar, the motivations of likely ratings prospects matters. In episode one, we showed off these results. Among our sample of 3,049 respondents, we found 29 bona fide past meter participants, and we asked them. What made you decide to participate? And the answers match what we've gotten from our projected meter wearers for years. It's about the money and these days prizes as well, because Nielsen is layering in national contests for the metered panel to try to keep people in paneled longer and to encourage them to wear their meters on days of historically lowered participation. So you can see their verbatim answers in front of you, or if that's too laborious, you can look at uh, my little chart in the lower right, and two thirds of them are really in it for the money. And that lines up pretty well with these numbers. This is among our sample of likely meter wares, which is about 14% of our sample of 3,049. We gave them a big long laundry list of why they would do this after they'd qualified through our series of four questions designed to mimic the hoops and hurdles they've got to jump through to play the Nielsen game as it were. Being paid for participation always rises up to the top. Now the bars in gold here, those are our PPM 60s. They are likely to play the PPM game and they listen to terrestrial radio at least 60 minutes, an hour a day. So we show them from time to time through this presentation because they're incredibly important people. So let's start here. We wanted to update you on music discovery and how terrestrial is faring up against digital competition. And here's the data. For music discovery, FM Today ekes out a very thin lead over YouTube as a music discovery tool. And if we concede that music discovery is more important to younger demos than older demos, it would be important to look at these results by demo. So we'll isolate just these top four, FM Radio, YouTube, Spotify, and Pandora on this next slide as we look at it broken out by demo. And the demos tell the tale. Among 14 to 24 is FM, number three for music discovery, behind YouTube and behind Spotify. As the demos go up, as you cross the 25 meridian, then finally FM pulls into the lead. And at 35, 44, 54, rather, 
uh, as perhaps new music discovery is becoming a little less important, their FM radio uh, pulls into the lead. Now, among respondents who have a radio station they listen to most, FM leads in pretty much every format, except urban where you'll see that YouTube gets just a little sniggle ahead. I wouldn't even call that a lead. They're approximately tied. Country, however, remains the bright spot among current oriented formats with FM there having a very clear advantage for music discovery. And while we're accustomed to seeing FM do better among those likely to play the ratings game with Nielsen, that doesn't show up here in any great measure. I show you the PPM uh, likelies and the diary likelies, those likely to play the ratings game. And if you uh, look at the 60s out on the uh, right uh, hand side of this page, the PPM 60s or the diary 60s, you'll see that they give FM a bit of a boost for music discovery because they're not only likely uh, meter or diary wearers, but they're also heavier users of radio. The numbers here are percentages who say they listen to each of these sources at least 30 minutes a day. FM remains on top among the music P1 groups here, but new digital sources are getting time spent listening as well, and notably YouTube as a music source. And while we'll suggest it's probably hard for respondents to account for their YouTube usage, was it really just music related or did they watch something else? The point here really is that people are increasingly aware that YouTube is a place they can go to get music on demand. And YouTube pops up when non-terrestrial users are included and the effects of Spotify and Pandora show up larger in this view as well. So we promised you to talk about contests, but we'll start here. Um, maybe you don't have budget for contests. You know, you're concerned that contests don't really match the station brand that you were thinking about right now. Well, there are still possibilities. These data from Ratings Prospects Study 10 from back in August of 2017 show the sway of commercial free music promises here among likely PPM wearers. It is number two, but it's only number two to severe weather, and I haven't figured out a way to schedule severe weather yet. So commercial free is a pretty big tout. Here it is among the likely diary keepers, and our marketing department has gotten great results for stations pushing a non-contest promotion concerning their commercial free music quantity, and these data show the reasons why that works. In these new data, we have majorities of likely ratings respondents agreeing that stations should save money on contests and cut back on commercials, and that would be one way you might script this. And admittedly, we planted this idea we served it up to them and just asked them to agree or disagree. You see the percentage here, percentages here who agreed. And you'll see that it has a little bit of a, a little bit of a backspin on the young end. It sticks up a little more among the 14 to 24. So if we break it out by format P1s and that library format, second from the right, I'm talking about classic rock, classic hits, and variety hits all swept into one pile. But you'll see that uh, this non-contest promotion resonates best among younger format P1s, specifically the rhythmic CHR and urban format P1s. So we titled this webinar around contesting and we're gonna deliver a lot of data on contesting here. Nothing works better than cash when it comes to contesting. These data are from Ratings Prospect Study 8 back in 2016 and shows the interest levels and different amounts of contest cash. We're a little more skeptical still of the $100 prize level as we stand here in 2018. It wasn't great in 2016, and as we've seen likely ratings respondents move a little bit more upscale in 2018 on the back of an improved economy, we'd say to avoid the $100 contest prize, but we still think $500 gives up only a couple of points to $1,000, and since we know that the more you can play the game, the more enticed contest players will be, we'd say the optimal contest cash prize these days remains $500. And it looks similar among the uh, likely diary keeper group as well. We promised a deep dive into contest appointment times, and here it is, every weekday prime hour faced off. And overall, you'll see that listeners would rather play when they're not on the company dime, either during their morning commute, perhaps the early part of the day, You'll see that spike uh, between noon and one while they're presumably happening at lunch or as you start to get there four or five o'clock and beyond. 
But you also see there's a deep dip at 10. We theorize that's when meetings and other mandatory work events occur, suggesting that if you're setting appointment times for a workday uh, oriented contest, avoid the 10 to 11 o'clock hour. If you drill down to the PPM 60s, those folks who are likely to play the PPM game and listen at least an hour a day, you'll note that there's another dip, not only 10 to 11 a.m., but also 3 to 4 p.m. In just a moment, I'll show you the same data broken up by likely diary keepers. If we filter by diary 60s, those likely to keep a diary who listen an hour a day, 10, 3, still low, and frankly, 4 p.m. doesn't look that healthy. Of course, you'd probably want to park your contest times earlier in the post-lunch period to try to grab the hours that follow. Ratings likelihood off format filter P1s off the meta message here is they'd rather play on their own time, not the company's time, but that won't match up to your goals of influencing their TSL while they're at work, because we know that these heavy listeners are those who listen at work. So grabbing those quarter hours during the workday can be critical because there's so much TSL at stake and these data give you new tools to optimize your appointment times. And since your goals are to grab up quarter hours while they're at work, another marketing channel becomes compelling. We wanted to show you this one again. We dip back to ratings prospect study 11 from the beginning of this year for these data about workplace telemarketing. Now, we don't recommend residential telemarketing any longer because there are fewer and fewer installed homes, and we can, and there are the problems with do not call us and caller ID that have made it very inefficient to contact people at home. But workplaces are very efficient to call. The number of contacts you need to make to be effective are reduced, and it turns out when it's on company time, large numbers of people are pretty happy to get a call about your contest to make them aware. And even in a workplace where maybe there are a lot of people with Spotify or Pandora, we've had great experience in renting them back for a book or more because they want the contest cash and they like the idea of playing your game. So talking about contests, managers and programmers wrestle with this every ratings period, national or group contesting versus local. So here are some new insights from past and the current study. From Ratings Prospect Study 11, back at the beginning of the year, we faced off a smaller local prize against a larger national prize, and the results were pretty starkly in favor of the smaller local prize. So in the current study, we pitted equal size prizes. Local and national got the same preference. Local is better. But this time, before we asked the questions for this face-off, we wanted to see if respondents were aware of group contesting. And the answer is that a majority of ratings likely are aware, but it's certainly not everyone. Among the likely PPM group, we're talking a little over half. Among the likely diary psychographic, we're talking about roughly three in five. It's not everyone. And the formats with the biggest contest profiles are where the, P or the uh, P1s are most aware. You'll see CHR and urban being the formats where the largest number of P1s were, avail were aware that there is such a thing as group contesting. But among those who are aware, most people don't think it's bad. Most don't really care very much at all. Uh, and some even like the idea to some extent because they think it means that there's more cash being thrown around. It's only about 13% of those who are aware who think it's bad. Remember, not everybody was aware. So when you put that 13% of those aware in perspective of the entire sample, the numbers get pretty small. It amounts to about 9% of the heavy listeners likely to play the PPM, PPM game. And overall, it's about 5%. And no more than 7% of any of the music format P1 groups here. It's fairly small. Now, among those who are aware and think it's bad, it's not a particularly large number, but among those who think it's bad, you're fighting the perception that their chances of winning are diminished. That's the complaint among the 334 out of 3,049 in our sample who said it was, who were aware and said it was bad. Uh, seven in 10 of those people said it was what really bothered them was it made them feel like it was less likely that they'd win. 
So with lawsuits about disclosure and general radio perceptions about uh, contesting being somewhat fake news, we know some disclosure is going to be necessary, but we would encourage you to use your skills as programmers and marketers to trumpet the benefits much more loudly than the downside. So if your contest is a group contest, don't trumpet it's a group deal, lower the decibels as much as you can. Trumpet that you've got big prizes that are happening all the time. Run lots of winter promos, but maybe avoid pointing out that the winner is from some city hundreds of miles away. Make sure that any local winners you do have get star treatment on the air and in your social media, and select your contest appointment times wisely if that's possible. Local contest, trumpet that it is local a very important element for those who are contest active. Make sure that your listeners know all the winners will be from the local market. Use a local number if you're uh, using a call in to win tactic. Make sure that's a local number. Emphasize the greater chances of winning since only people who listen to your station from your market are playing the game. Ensure that contest appointment times are optimized and are exactly what you need and run lots of winner promos and showcase everything possible to underscore that all your winners are local. We shared a healthy helping of social media results in episode one, but here's a refresher and a deeper dive on a couple of points. In the spring, we showed you Facebook's daily usage hole in uh, 14 to 24 women. And as of this new study, the hole has spread to males 14 to 24. YouTube, though, remains massive. Instagram, very strong among 14 to 34s, holding Snapchat at bay or in check, as you will. Instagram becoming more integral to younger format P1s, but Facebook retains leadership for daily usage among almost all of these music format P1 groups. And among those likely to play the PPM game, Facebook remains vital, except at the very youngest end at 14 to 24 is Instagram potent 14 clear up to 44 and consider that Facebook and Instagram are co-owned and you get the idea of how powerful that platform can be. Among those likely to play the diary game, Facebook remains vital except again with the youngest consumers and again Instagram potent here 14 up to 44 and again they're owned by the same people. This is compulsive usage. I've been showing you daily usage numbers. These are at least four touches per day. And you can see the big numbers for YouTube at the younger end where there's lots of reliance on YouTube for music usage as well. So you can message those consumers with frequency to bring them back to your brand if you employ the right tactics. Similar profile here shown among the likely diary keepers. So there's a drive through the data, and I'll turn things over to PJ to show to show you some more. And those last few slides that Lee just showed you illustrate exactly why we do these studies twice a year, and we use that data to make decisions for our clients' marketing. Uh, Facebook has been the far and away leader for the last couple of years, and you just saw that they're still big, but what's really jumped out to us is YouTube's growth, particularly in the last six months. So I want to talk a bit about some of the newest secret sauce we've been uh, utilizing for our clients in those channels on the marketing side. Now, we like a shiny object as much as the next marketing nerd, but because of how consistently big those channels are, the Facebook and Google ecosystems make up what we call the foundational four, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Google Ads, and YouTube. And because of YouTube surge among ratings prospects, particularly when it comes to things like music discovery with the young end of the demo, I want to start with that. One of the reasons why we like the Google and YouTube ecosystem, besides how well it does with survey-friendly radio listeners, is its commitment to preventing ad fraud, whereas the programmatic exchange-traded publisher marketplace is rife with websites and apps that use things like bots and other tactics to essentially pretend to serve display and video ads. Google aggressively enforces fraud and even credits accounts retroactively when click and view fraud is detected. Plus, YouTube is its own walled garden. Uh, It gives ad buyers further reassurance that we're not buying in a marketplace that is a total free-for-all. Now, while there are a lot of different ways to buy ads in terms of CPM, when you need to reach a ton of people during your campaign, YouTube bumper videos are going to be the best foot forward for radio. These are six-second non-skippable ads that are great for driving reach and frequency. They're just long enough to get your message across, but not too long that you risk casual listeners bailing before they even get to the content that they were seeking. For radio, this is a great complement to a broader overall campaign that also utilizes channels that allow for display or longer video messaging. 
Now, while YouTube bumper videos are excellent for reach and frequency, it's this next ad unit that really focuses on the deep, heavy listeners to your radio station. These are called TrueView ads, and what's great about TrueView is that you only pay for engagement. They come in two types. The first are in-stream ads, which play next to other video content. Unlike bumper videos, TrueView in-stream ads are skippable after five seconds, but because we're only paying for engagement, the cost to you only occurs when someone makes it to 30 seconds of your video or completes the video, whichever is shorter. And because of this, you know that you're only paying for those that are really absorbing your content. However, it does come at a cost and it can be a real budget burner if it's the only tool that you utilize. To complement in-stream ads, there are also TrueView discovery ads, which show up in places like search results or as related content, and you're only paying for those impressions when someone clicks on your video. And now in both cases, it's a great way to showcase longer form content that your team has put together to help bolster your campaign. But whether you're building for six second or 30 plus second attention spans, the same best practices still apply. Plan on people watching your videos on mute, at least to start with. Uh, use clear, concise, engaging, creative, and make sure to ask for the order within the first five seconds. The latest addition to the Google ad ranks are called outstream videos. Much like YouTube bumper videos, Google outstream videos have similar functionality. They're great for casting a wide net quickly and efficiently, but unlike bumper videos, outstream videos also serve on Google video partners. Whereas in-stream videos would always play next to video content, whether through pre-roll, mid-roll, or post-roll, outstream videos play away from video content. If you've ever been scrolling through an article, had to scroll past an ad just to get to the rest of the content, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here. It's this native placement that helps you get more eyes on your ads, and they're a strong choice when reach and frequency are the goal. Uh, they're also mobile only and designed as such, so users can easily tap to unmute, scroll past it if they aren't interested, or click through to your destination page if they are. Now, speaking of that destination page, I think it's important to bring it up because of just how much it's impacting radio campaigns in the latter part of 2018. Uh, the major platforms each have their own version of a low quality or disruptive content policy, but the basics of them uh, are each uh, pretty similar. Uh, you want to make sure that your ads link to a page that includes significant and original content that's relevant. So if it's an ad for your contest, it should link to the contest page. But once they're there, be careful about the number of ads on the page and in particular, the user experience of those ads huge pop-ups or interstitials, uh, ads that require clicks to see the whole thing, malicious or deceptive ads, basically anything that drives you crazy when you go visit a page that should be eliminated from your destination page for any and all campaign ads that you're running. But without even unmuting your phones, I can hear the collective groans of those whose pages and templates are all corporate controlled. Uh, luckily, we found that some flexibility is starting to happen since this is an issue that's really not going away. And let's be honest, it's a better experience for your listeners anyway, so uh, it's certainly a good thing to fight for. But it, it absolutely takes time. So if there's a campaign that you're planning for in the future, start having those conversations with corporate and thinking about this now. And finally, I want to touch on the other half of the foundational four, Facebook and Instagram, and a couple of the newer placement options that are being offered for this fall and beyond. If you play the name game with your audience and are focused on at work listening, Facebook lead gen is going to be the ad unit for you. Uh, some of our best ratings lists have come from uh, using outbound office telemarketing along with this ad unit. And while it's great for ratings, it's also great for the listener. People don't want to have to work to enter your contests. And what's nice about the Facebook lead gen ad is that it's all native, so they don't have to leave the Facebook user experience to enter. And then as an added bonus, the information fields autofill with the data that Facebook already has, meaning they're able to enter in just a couple of clicks or taps. They simply have to confirm their info rather than type it all in. Next are Facebook Messenger ads. I wouldn't consider this a staple per se, but a good flavor for your campaign. Uh, while they can operate as a traditional Facebook ad in a place that a huge number of users spend their time in, they also have the added benefit of being able to start a real organic conversation with your audience with, with just one click. With Facebook animated GIF ads, uh, you get the benefits of engagement that are similar to video ads while paying the kinds of prices normally associated with display ads. And if you're a younger demo station, all of a sudden you're communicating your message in a language that your audience uses every day. And just like Messenger and GIF ads, Instagram stories offer an opportunity to get your message across not only in a platform that the audience is using, but in a way that engages them and invites interaction and conversation. So those are a few of the things that we'll be using this fall to generate success for our clients. And with that, I turn it back to Lee. Thanks, PJ. And thanks to all of you for 
let's face it, sitting through this presentation. Uh, our producer, Jake, has been lining the chat fields while uh, PJ and I have been blathering. Uh, Jake, do we have any questions? Yes, thank you everybody for your questions. Uh, the first question is, um, does our research suggest that the commute to work times are more valuable uh, than contest appointment times during the work day? Uh, it would depend on what your contest goal is. Uh, most, so many contests are really run in hopes of boosting workday, uh, workday AQH because there's, if you're, if we're talking about heavy listeners to radio, we're talking about people who tend to listen at work. So, uh, so many quarter hours are up uh, during those times, while contest participation might be attenuated a little bit uh, while they're at work. That's when you're trying to motivate them. So we'd suggest parking your contest appointment times toward the beginnings of those periods. We like the combination of at the very front of the workday and maybe a reset right after lunchtime to get them back into the swing uh, to make sure they uh, don't stray from your station when they come back from lunch. But overall, unless your goal is to make a giant contest, in which case, yes, the commute times have more people available to play the game, but that won't help your AQH during the workday. Yeah, and the uh, biggest successes have come when we've, uh, with our clients, have, have come when we've set appointments early in the workday, as Lee mentioned. 8 a.m. is probably going to be best, especially if it is tied to a commercial free hour. Good point. Great. Um, maybe uh, I, we had a question come in that um, um, says, uh, what about sports talk radio? So maybe uh, if you can maybe just touch on um, how maybe that would pertain um, to, to, the, to the spoken word field. Uh, well, uh, it works just the same. I, I mean, if we're talking about workday contesting, uh, that works in spoken word formats as well. Uh, sports is easier to do contests up against than all news stations. Um, you know, it's a matter of how you're going to structure the game so you can weave it into programming. But if you've got uh, the desire to lift you know, listening during what we would think of as the workday, nine to five, or frankly, these days, in most markets, the workday, more than half of those who are going to go to work for the day are there between eight and nine. Uh, you set your appointment times appropriately. Did I answer the question that was out there, Jake, or did I misinterpret? I, th I, th I think so, um, if, if, if it wasn't okay. answered um, to their liking. Oh, we got, we got a yes. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, uh, the next question is, um, uh, uh, is there any way to do any of what we just talked about without a marketing budget? Um, well, it's a great question. Uh, yeah, the, uh, it's a great question. It's certainly uh, certainly a lot of the tactics that we talk about have uh, involved some form or fashion of a marketing budget. Uh, there's certainly data that Lee showed you that I think can apply to your contesting, whether you have a marketing budget or not. Um, it, certainly things like appointment times, uh, the, the behaviors of uh, PPM and diary likelies are certainly all important. Um, and we've also, uh, as Lee mentioned, a, a a little bit during uh, his portion about the value of commercial free hours. Now we don't have a realistic expectation is uh, that you can you know remove a bunch of commercials off your station but if you can move some things around to sort of generate some commercial free hours if you have any kind of budget if you're running some kind of contest uh, we have found a uh, certainly a lift amongst um, uh, stations that have uh, shifted their budget from contesting into marketing and going with more of a commercial free direction, or if you've got a major day part like a big morning show and can kind of focus on that, uh, those kinds of things can become a better use of the money uh, in some cases. Um, it would all kind of depend on your situation, but that, that's one way to slice that, if you will. Great. Thanks. Uh, next question is, um, this person uh, would love to use uh, the new bumper video ads, um, and they do have a contest in mind, um, but it does not It does involve a registration uh, or a sign-up. Um, they're wondering if they can use uh, those ads for a contest like that. Um, well, the short answer is no. Uh, you certainly can, but I wouldn't. Uh, as Google products go, there is a version of TrueView called TrueView for Action that would be the best option for that as it's focused on driving actions like traffic to your website, 
Um, and we've also heard that Google will have their own version of a lead gen ad unit in the coming months. So that could be a great alternative. Uh, but when registrations are key, our clients have found that m the most success comes through a combination of workplace telemarketing along with Facebook's lead gen ads, particularly if you're looking for at work listening. Uh, and we have a feeling that the new Google lead gen product, whatever that ends up being, will be a pretty good option to pair with uh, telemarketing as well. Um, I'd also recommend checking out uh, the recording of one of our past webinars that's on our site. Uh, it's called How to Win the Workplace war which gets into some more detail about some of these tactics great thanks uh, the next question is um, this person wants to know about uh, diary keepers and their motivation to participate in Nielsen um, they're asking if we have any data to suggest that they may be less motivated by cash and more motivated by sharing their opinion um, since the money in diary markets can be so much smaller and I'm so sorry that we didn't include that in, in this uh, in this particular presentation. The answer is they're motivated exactly the same way. Yes, it's only a couple of bucks for each of the uh, each of the diaries uh, within the household, and I know that doesn't seem like a lot of money, but it lines up to that psychographic brilliantly. So the the bars that we showed you with uh, their motivations for PPM are awfully similar. Uh, for diary, it's about cash and prizes ultimately. Even though it's only a couple of bucks, we're talking about the psychographic that is motivated by a couple of bucks. Hey, it's money I didn't have before, more for me, less for you. Great. Cool. Uh, last question is, um, how do some of the recently announced uh, changes to targeting Facebook uh, affect radio? Um, what are what are, what can people do can't do now that they could do, and uh, what are some of the workarounds? Uh, it's a great question. Um, we can't exclude by ethnicity, which uh, we haven't been able to, to do for a while, like about a year, but the recently announced changes that, that uh, this uh, person is referring to involves the ability to target exclusively by ethnicity. So for example, if you're an urban station that wants to target only African Americans, um, that has been reduced. Uh, in addition to that, Facebook has eliminated their relationships with some of their data providers that give us insight into ethnic data. So the options have certainly become more limited, but things like interest and behavior targeting, th those things still exist. They allow us to get close. Uh, the biggest opportunity for a workaround, though, is when we've paired direct mail with digital for our clients that need this kind of targeting. Uh, the direct mail household data that we get, it gives us great insight into who we're targeting, and then we can apply that data to a digital campaign as well. Great. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. They're really outstanding questions. This has been great. And we really appreciate you guys and gals, gals, I didn't say that, did I? You men and women uh, listening in today. Uh, we'd invite you to look at any of our past webinars, which all live at newvoodoo.com forward slash webinars. In the next 24 hours, you'll get an email with a recording, sadly, of, uh, of today's presentation. Uh, if you wanted to be able to show one of these charts or graphs to a, to a coworker, or somebody uh, above you in the food chain, uh, that's completely available. And we appreciate you so much. Uh, and you know how to get in touch with us should you be able to use our services, be it for marketing or for research. Thanks again, folks.